dear colleagues, my name is Michel Perrottino. I am the head of the Department of Political Science of the Institute of Political Studies at the Faculty of Social Sciences of the Charles University here in Prague. I am very glad and honored to officially open the Steinwurkan lecture in the name of the local organizers and on behalf of the ECPR. Unfortunately, uh, this year, this lecture and the joint sessions have to be online due to the pandemic. However, I hope we will soon be able to go back into some version of the old normality of direct gathering, full of informality and human reality. I hope that we will meet here in Prague at least in 2024 for the ECPR joint sessions. I would like to thank uh, Hanna Kubatova, a member of the ECPR Executive Committee, who has coordinated this year's events, and to all the members of the ECPR staff. It's my great pleasure to present to you the person who organized this meeting at our department, Petra Gosti, who is now, since February of this year, our new colleague and newly associate professor of democratic theory. Petra joined our department after many years abroad. Her journey took for her from the Czech Academy of Science, uh, where she's on leave, to cities like Bremen, Würzburg, Mainz, Frankfurt, and Cambridge, Massachusetts. In March 2019, she completed an eight months visiting democracy fellowship at Harvard University's Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation at the John F. Kennedy School of Government. She focused on the contemporary reconfiguration of representative democracy. And in April 2021, Petra completed her habilitation, Democracy Disrupted, at the Goethe University, Frankfurt. Petra research focuses on reconfiguring the political landscape and revolves around three major themes, representation, democratization, and of course, populism. As a scholar and as a person who crossed the metaphorical bridge between the East and the West many times, back and forth, Petra is well situated to moderate this debate with leading scholars of comparative politics. Thank you, Petra, for chairing this ECPR Stein work on lecture with such great speakers, and please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. That's uh, really, it's wonderful. Thank you. I feel really welcome and a bit shy. But uh, to put on the hat of uh, somebody who crosses the bridge. So welcome, everybody. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this uh, Steinrokan uh, lecture how we will proceed. I will first uh, briefly introduce our topic, perhaps saying some words, being a little bit uh, provocative uh, on purpose, trying to stimulate our discussion and questions. Then I will introduce our, uh, our panelists and uh, we will proceed, uh, proceed with, the, with the questions and their, their input. So starting with a couple of words. So what are the East and the West? The East is a loosely defined set of countries that spent more than half a 20th century behind the Iron Curtain. But what is the West? Liberal democracies, the US and the EU countries, but perhaps the East and the West are shortcuts attempting to simplify complex reality, difficult to grasp for those who live it, who study it and who gaze at it. If they are constructs, it's possible to reconstruct them, not along what makes them distinct, but what they share. The one common aspect across the region and the world is the decline of democratic quality in the last decade. The symptoms include declining trust in democratic institutions, emboldened uncivil society, increased political control over media, civic apathy and nationalistic contestation. There is little agreement on the symptoms, causes, effects, and trajectory of this ongoing change, decline in the quality of democracy. The East and the West are stereotypes rooted in some historical reality, but counterproductive three decades later, as they thwart systematic study of change. Overgeneralization and underconceptualization prevent us from seeing both the variation 
and the similarities across the East and West. Perhaps we ought to focus on historical legacies, elite choices, institutional variation, and the difference in the agency of citizens to play an active part in the democratic processes. 30 years after the fall of Iron Curtain, comparative research still struggles with incorporating Central and Eastern Europe into mainstream comparative research. Many are quick to see these countries as predestined to failure, democracy too shallow and perhaps only emulated. Institutions in the youngish democracies may have shallow roots and citizen attitudes may be less stable, but this is increasingly the case in Western democracies. And so when Western democracies and scholars of Western democracy are gazing at the East, perhaps they are gazing into their own future. This panel assembles scholars whose work transcends the East-West divide to discuss how to move beyond this perhaps outdated paradigm, how to bridge the East-West divide. The panelists are eminent scholars of political parties, social movements and democracy, and touch many of these issues in their work. It's my pleasure to invite you to discuss ways of balancing out general trends and unique features of Central and Eastern Europe. Let me now briefly introduce you to the panelists in the order as they will speak. Fernando Casalbartoa is an associate professor in comparative politics at the University of Nottingham. He studied law in Pamp Pamplona, political science in Salamanca and Central and Eastern European studies at Jagiellonian University. Uh, Fernando and uh, Jolt Enieri have recently published a monograph titled Party System Closures, Party Alliances, Government, Alternative and Democracy in Europe with Oxford University Press. Fernando holds uh, many, many awards, but for the sake of uh, if you're interested, you can look at the ECPR website to see them all. Our next speaker is Professor Jolt Enieri. Uh, Jolt is Professor of Political Science at the Central European University and a Leverhulm visiting professor at Oxford University. Professor Enyedi uh, focuses in his research on party politics, comparative government, church and state relations, and political psychology, especially authoritarianism, prejudices, and political tolerance. He is also recipient and winner of many awards and the other parent, uh, the, the co-parent of the party systems closure book. Lenka Bushtikova is our next speaker and is joining us from Phoenix, Arizona. She grew up in Prague and we are very proud that she is the alumna of the Faculty of Social Sciences at the Charles University in Prague. After crossing her bridge to, to the West, uh, she, earned, uh, she earned PhD in political science from Duke University and many other, she's holder of many other master degrees. She's now an uh, associate professor in the School of Politics and Global Studies in Arizona at Arizona State University. Her research focuses on party politics, voting behavior, clientelism, state capacity, with a special reference to Eastern Europe. Her book, Extreme Reactions, Radical Right Mobilization in Eastern Europe, is Cambridge University Press won uh, also many important awards and she also won other awards which you can see uh, all on the ECPR website. Our next speaker is Professor Andrei Cisar. Andrei is a professor of sociology at the Faculty of Social Sciences, Charles University in Prague, and is also affiliated to the Institute of Sociology of the Czech Academy of Sciences. Andrei's research in political sociology focuses on social movements, political protest and comparative politics. His current project include climate justice activism and the role of expertise in the public sphere. And finally, Professor Milada Vachudova, who is also joining us from United States, specializes in party systems, political change in post-communist Europe. She's a Jean Monnet chair and associate professor of political science at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and she's part of the core team of the Chapel Hill Expert Survey. I would be remiss not to mention one of my favorite books, uh, Europe Undivided, which is authored by Professor Vachudova, Europe Undivided Democracy, Leverage and Integration After Communism, this Oxford University Press was awarded the Steinrockan Prize for Comparative Social Science Research. 
So this, uh, these are our eminent scholar and without further ado, uh, we will now proceed with the questions. So first I ask to all of you a question, uh, which I will read so that our audience knows. And then I will, uh, I will address the, the question which was, uh, which was individually for you. So to all, in your research, you have studied phenomena from party system through radical right, social movements and democratic backsliding. Your work shows that all these can be observed both in the West and in the East. How does your research grapple with balancing out general trends and unique features of the Central and Eastern European region? And to our first uh, additional question, to, to our first uh, speaker, Fernanda Casalbertoa, your recent published book is an unparalleled tour de force. You cover 65 European party system from 1848, from 1848 until 2019, comparatively, you show an increasing convergence between the Western and the Eastern European party systems. Can you elaborate on the convergence? Do important differences prevail? Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I will del, uh, then try to give a, a brief you know, uh, understanding from, from our work uh, to whether we should hold Jedi on, on this issue of, of, of convergence, right? And, and also, of uh, how we, we look at, at, at this, let's say, you know, a comparison between uh, East and West, you know, using, you know, going to the first question, you know, different, you know, methodologies and, and different approaches. So what we see clearly is a process of, of convergence in, you know, in, in three arenas, electoral, uh, parliamentary and, and governmental. Uh, we all remember, you know, the early works, early post-transition scholars that predicted that with time, you know, post-communist party systems would become, you know, as institutionalized as those consolidated Western European democracies. See, even, even drew from examples from, from Southern Europe, you know, the well, other region that I know quite well, uh, to show how the future would look uh, in the East, right? But, you know, the, we have other scholars like Peter Mann himself, you know, who were more skeptical, you know, in 1995, you know, he, he was talking already about or predicting that, that, that post-communist party systems would remain largely unstable. And, you know, in an article that uh, we published, you know, three years ago, in a special issue in East European politics and, and societies, we, we found that, you know, Mayor was, you know, mostly right, not in every detail, and that, you know, post-communist party systems certainly remain uh, at large, you know, uh, uh, unstable, right? And, and, and moreover, you know, and what is, I think it is ironically and, and, and very interesting that, you know, the changes in the West, however, were matching and mimicking, you know, the, tra the trajectories in the, in the East. In the book that you that you mentioned uh, kindly enough uh, in our presentation, you know we'll go you know in deep into this uh, issue of the convergence of party systems between you know east and west with a data set that goes back to 1848 and that is now publicly available at whogovernance.eu. And because you know I think that you know an image is worth uh, 1,000 words, I would like now to to show you uh, a couple of graphs if if, if possible. So basically, what uh, what you will see, uh, what you will see, what you see here is uh, using Pedersen index of electoral volatility, the level of you know stability at the uh, electoral arena of party systems distinguishing between three regions, you know, Eastern Europe, you know, the, the line, you know, Southern Europe, the points, and Western Europe, the, the dash. What you can see here is that the, at the electoral level, you know, Eastern European party systems, even if still very unstable. In fact, you know, more than 20% of voters change partisan preference from one election to, to the next, you know, are, are you know, uh, becoming more stable in, in the electoral arena. Well, you know, the South and Western European party systems, the level of volatility is increasing. And, you know, this is very interesting for the West, which has reached the, you know, threshold that Pedersen talked about when looking at earthquake elections. So 50%. So we could say that nowadays almost every election that takes place in the West, you know, is an earthquake. In fact, you know, one looks at, you know, the Journal of West European Politics and at the summaries and reviews of elections. And, you know, the titles are tsunami, earthquake, hurricane. You know. So clearly, you know, there is a, a, a higher degree of instability in the West uh, and, the, and the South. And this in clear contrast, you know, this convergence that we see at the electoral level, 
it's in clear contrast with what we see, for example, in the in the interwar period, where there we, what we have basically is an asymmetric convergence in the sense that both South and Eastern European party systems became electorally more stable, just to trying to you know uh, mirror what was happening in the in the West, right? And this is something that you know could be, can be explained. For example, Chiara Monte, Manuel and Soare have an article in government opposition where they talk about you know the the, the 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 explanation being you know the the alteration volatility, meaning the higher number of new parties and you know a party system fragmentation that takes place now in the West, and in fact. This is something that you can see in the next graph that comes directly from, from, from our book. You see that European, uh, Western European and Southern European party systems used to have you know, below four, three you know, effective parties. You see it in the 80s and, and before. In the 90s, you know, Eastern Europeans, uh, Eastern European party systems were you know, uh, still very fragmented, but you know, soon you know, catch up you know, with uh, Western Europe and are now you know, even converging with uh, you know, uh, South, Southern Europe, which has, of course, especially after the 2008 Great Recession, increased you know, in the level of uh, uh, fragmentation to the point that reaching you know, since the end of the Second World War, the highest, the highest level. In my own work, uh, you know, I have found, you know, basically two reasons for this, you know, sociological, clearly the thawing of, you know, traditional cleavages in the West due to the process of, you know, globalization and, of course, secularization uh, that makes West, the West closer to the East, where, you know, cleavages have been weaker or if we take you know, Bartolini and Mer, you know, seminal definition, in some cases we can say that they were not even cleavages uh, at all. But also, you know, from institutional point of view, in the sense that, you know, electoral systems in the East have done a very good work in reducing the, the, the level of fragmentation. You know, they are mostly more, di more disproportional than you can find in the West. It is also very interesting to see, once again, the contrast with the interwar period in the 30s. There, you cannot see at all any process of uh, convergence. But this convergence, you know, is not only at the electoral and parliamentary arena, but, you know, you can also see it at the governmental arena. And this is the center of our, of our uh, new book. You know, we use the notion of created by Peter Mayer, a party system closure, and we use a new indicator that we have created specifically for the book, where we look at the, the levels of stability of patterns of interaction at the time of government formation, weighted you know, by, by, by time. And we can see that while, you know, Eastern European party systems are still more open than Western and Southern European ones, what we clearly see is that, you know, in the West and in the South, especially after the 2008 Great Recession, has been, you know, an openness, a decline in the level of predictability in the structure of competition. While familiarity of governing formulas and access to office have been, for example, more close in countries like Hungary, Poland, Croatia, North Macedonia, Georgia, or to mention the last East European elections, Albania, you know, new governing parties have appeared in Greece, my own country, Spain, France, Iceland, and totally unseen and unpredictable coalition governments have appeared in Italy, Austria, Norway, Spain, and to mention perhaps the last one, Ireland. You know, for the first time ever, we see a grand coalition between, you know, Fiona Ford and Fiona uh, Girl. And you see also that while you see this kind of, you know, symmetric convergence, you know, between the East and the West at the level of, you know, party system closure, in the case of, you know, the interwar period, the, the, the convergence was more asymmetric in the sense that, you know, it was, you know, the East and the South that they were coming to the levels of the stable, you know, and ideal West. In, in perhaps, you know, this is what led, you know, scholars at the very beginning to think that this would be the future of party politics in post-communist uh, Europe. In the book, we try to look at this convergence and we try to explain, you know, this you know, a very difference in the level of partisan enclosure by looking not just, you know, at the uh, decreasing levels of partisan fragmentation in the East, as we saw in the previous slide, but we also see that, you know, there is a sharper decrease or process of party deinstitutionalization in the West and in the South. And also we see that there is an increase you know, in the level of uh, polarization. Equally, 
in the south and in the in the in the west. And in this sense, you know, we could explain, you know, this 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 convergence. In, to conclude, you know, uh, trying to answer, you know, the question. Now. So we see a clear convergence between, you know, the east and the and the west. We see that this convergence is taking place at the three arenas of interparty competition. So electoral, parliamentary, uh, governmental. We see that the process is totally different to what we could see, for example, in the interwar period, where we have you know, the three you know, regions and this comparison between East and West. At that time, there was no convergence or the convergence took place in an asymmetric way, not symmetric like now. And also, you know, we clearly see that what is happening is not what it was predicted, that you know, the East would become as stable as the, as the West. What we see is that it's the West that is becoming as unstable as the, as the East. So just to wait, uh, uh, end with more colorful words that our friends and colleagues, you know, Tim Houghton and Kevin Degan Kranz uh, usually put it in their new book, The Future Lies Is. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fernando. Um, thank you. And now um, I will ask uh, Jolt to, to address us. And for him, the additional question is, is there something specific about the Central and Eastern European region, which comparative research still ought to focus on? Jolt, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Petra, for the invitation and for the kind words. So let me uh, <clears throat> say as an introduction that I think it's wrong to automatically group countries into East and West, because often there are other more consequential divides. Having said that, um, legacies matter. And um, the concept of past dependency can be applied not only to institutions, but to entire constellations of conflicts, just like uh, Stein Rockham has showed us. So there is uh, a lot of legitimacy in probing into uh, post-communist versus non-post-communist differences. In the book that uh, Fernando uh, uh, summarized, we look at the relationship between party system closure and democracy at two different levels. We look at how uh, party system closure influences the survival of democracies and their quality. Now, when it comes to uh, survival, we find a, a strong uh, co-variation in the sense that um, there are virtually no examples of closed party systems collapsing and, and uh, um, uh, democracy being replaced by another uh, type of uh, rule. It's an asymmetric relationship in the sense that um, there are systems that are open and yet they survive. And here there is a difference between East and West because most of the examples come from the East that are systems that are very open and still surviving as democracies. It's very difficult to disentangle whether this is a regional effect or a cohort effect because uh, the last cohort of party system, the, the ones that were created at the end of the uh, 1980s, uh, beginning of 1990s, are of course uh, mostly coming from Eastern Europe. We find, however, much larger differences uh, or more, more interesting differences when we look at the quality of democracy. In Western Europe, quality of democracy and the degree of party system closure is typically not closely associated. In post-communist Europe, we do find an association and it is to some extent different from the one that we would expect. So if I may uh, show um, just one slide, um, the slide that uh, you can also find in the book that groups uh, um, East European uh, party systems according to the quality of democracy along three different um, um, monitoring agencies and closure. What you see is that there is a group of countries, basically Montenegro, Hungary, Albania, North Macedonia, and Georgia, which are high on closure, but low on uh, quality of democracy. And there is another group of countries, Slovenia, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Czechia, Slovakia, which tend to be uh, low on closure, but uh, uh, relatively high on, on the quality of democracy. Of course, this is something that uh, changes uh, from year uh, to year to some extent, but the overall configuration stays the same. 
which indicates that there are two paths in Eastern Europe, one where conflicts are dispersed and another one where conflicts are concentrated. Uh, the degree of institutionalization is high, but what gets institutionalized is either clientelism or uh, the predominance of one force over uh, the other, um, also at, uh, uh, polarization, mutual distrust. So in this case, the degree of institutionalization is actually undermining the quality of democracy. Now, let me uh, quickly mention seven other uh, features that I find uh, relevant when it comes to the East-West comparison that uh, uh, comes from some other uh, studies. One interesting uh, finding that we had with uh, my colleague Boyan Todosevich was that uh, in Western Europe, partisanship, party identification leads to higher um, satisfaction with democracy. In Eastern Europe, it doesn't have that kind of effect, but it leads to higher degree of radicalism. This means that the integrative impact of partisanship doesn't materialize in East as well as does in the West, and we don't know exactly why is it so. The other interesting uh, difference concerned party loyalties and class effects. We know that uh, both of them are declining in the West, but they are still much, much stronger than in the East. So in this regard, the two regions are still uh, very far from each other. The third is the structure of the, uh, of the political space. Um, it has been uh, discovered by Kitschert and others already back in the 1990s that in Eastern Europe, you have some sort of um, protection versus freedom polarization, as opposed to the left versus right polarization. It's, in different words, this is left authoritarianism versus right libertarianism. Much of it survives, interestingly. It has not been washed away. Uh, there is also a, a priority on cultural uh, matters in East that we sort of inherited, and the West is catching up in that regard, but still not where the East is. Then the fourth one is the role of ethnicity. It is important in specific West European countries, but it's much more important, much more powerful factor uh, in East, and Jan Rovni and others uh, look into the uh, influence of this factor. Then there is also uh, the related issue of um, uh, importance of clientelistic strategies in, uh, in party competition. And what is also relevant in this regard is the role of informal structures. So, so, so to some extent, one can argue that uh, the um, subject we are studying, uh, those of us who study parties, um, is not the right subject because there are some informal mechanisms behind formal party organization and political institution that really matter, at least in most of the East European countries. The sixth one is elite agency. The, the, you, you do see uh, spectacular examples of that in the West as well, and nowadays with Macron, earlier with Berlusconi and so on, but it's much more important in uh, uh, East in general because of uh, the role of strong men. And finally, uh, the, the specificity of populism in government or, or um, yeah, um, populist establishment. This is something that uh, soon uh, the Westerners will uh, also know more about uh, as soon as Salvini is elected uh, as prime minister. But uh, this is something that we could uh, teach uh, them about uh, quite a lot. That's it. Thank you so much, uh, Joel. This was so informative. Thank you. Now we will move to, to Lenka. And uh, for her, the two questions were, your book, Extreme Reactions, focuses on the backlash against minority rights following accommodation of minority demands. Currently, the world is in the midst of culture wars, and we are observing backlash against LGBT rights, both in the East and in the West, often in the absence of previous accommodation. How would you extend your theory to these cases? Lenka, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to thank Michelle and Petra for your kind invitation. Uh, as Michelle mentioned in his kind remarks, uh, I studied at the Faculty of Social Sciences. I studied sociology and social policy. And over time, I migrated. And we met with Petra many years ago at a Xerocopy machine at the Institute of Sociology. So, hooray to dying Xerocopy machines. So, as uh, some of you might know, let me just um, 
um, before I sort of go to the specifics of Petra's question, um, let me just say that I think this is a very important panel that I think the East-West divide is um, alive and well. And in some way, you know, when I thought about uh, what I've wrote and um, in some way my book contributes to the East-West silo in the, in the sense that it was explicitly written as a book that addresses, um, you know, Eastern Europe or the so-called Eastern Europe. However, since the beginning, the ambition was the book is to develop a theory that um, hopefully might apply uh, in the West or, um, or in other countries. And one thing I would like to mention, one important thing that um, I think um, associated um, in, with my book is that, you know, there is a West-East divide, but there's also an East-East divide in the sense that a lot of you know very brilliant scholarship on Eastern Europe comes from the scholars of the V4 countries, you know the usual suspects: Czech Republic, Slovakia, Poland, Hungary. But there is also an East and there is also a South. So one of the very important things in my book was to think about the case of Ukraine and the importance of the case uh, stems from the fact that it um, shows sort of limitations of some of the you know theories of radical right mobilization that were developed in the West. And really, uh, the Ukrainian democratic resilience um, is something that we uh, need to really think about because if you sort of think about structural conditions and many other factors going into democratic resilience, Ukraine defies it all. So I would call not only for bridging the East-West divide, but also bridging the West-East-East divide. And of course, um, you know, it is in the true oriental sense, uh, the way the scholarship is produced is that you take, you know, outstanding, excellent theories in, from in the West and you apply them to a backwards region, be it, you know, Latin America, Eastern Europe, Southeast Asia, and then you just hope and beg that the West scholars of Western Europe pay attention to your work. So that's, you know, where I'm at. Uh, but, uh, you know, to go back to, uh, Petra's question, the main argument of the book, uh, as Petra outlined, is um, um, uh, it sort of argues that um, that radical right mobilization stems from um, a backlash against um, expansion of rights by ascendant minority groups. So it's a reactive theory in which the book sort of argues that prejudice against minorities is not a sentiment exclusive to right-wing voters, which is actually something that was discovered by Tien's Ridgren, a prominent Swedish sociologist that inspired my work. But it shows that variation in how minorities are accommodated explains electoral success. Um, of party of radical right parties. And the book mostly deals with ethnicity, but it also de deals with issues of social conservatism. And um, I think the um, you know theory, the theory uh, in my view is flexible enough to uh, address issues of LGBT mobilization and mobilization around gender rights. And you know, we have also worked on this issue together with Petra, because at the core of the argument is the idea of shifts or changes in the status quo or uh, demands that um, you know that rattle the cage. And we have seen um, in past, you know, 10, 15, five years, a big shift in the status quo in the sense that the LGBT community, you know, came out of the closet, as is one of the uh, articles that we published with Petra and is demanding, you know, registered partnership. They're demanding to be treated not like, you know, uh, pedophiles and dogs. Uh, and they, they want to adopt children. They want to have, you know, they want to live in dignity. And this is something that that changes the status quo in the sense that the you know status quo under communism or even after 99 was you know don't ask don't tell as you know homosexuality was criminalized for um for a long time so it is it is a process that creates backlash i mean the the civil learning and the theory is that you know backlash in the short run but you know perhaps some reconciliation in the long run and the same i would say uh, goes for gender rights. There are, of course, many, many reasons why gender rights are being um, uh, are being activated these days. But I think, in a sense, um, it you know the theory can be applied as well. In a way, you have a situation, especially you have a sort of rise of new professional class um, um, of of women um, and you know women that uh, grew up after 1989 who suddenly demand things like equal pay, you know, they, they demand not being, you know, touched inappropriately in their workplace. 
And it is it shatters societal norms again, it changes the status quo. There is a demand to change legislatures, um, maybe institute some quotas. So in that way, um, as as broadly the theory um, was written, is um, uh, I think it can be applied. Of course, as I always say, the devil is in the detail. In the book, I tried to figure out indicators of status elevation, and that is always very difficult, especially once you traffic in, you know, symbolic domains or domains in which it is very difficult to pinpoint what would be the measure of, of status elevation. But I think once you do that, you know, it can be tested and hopefully uh, expanded, but we will see. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lenka. You are five minutes in, and here is your second question, so I won't uh, let you get away with it. So your <laughs> recent work uh, was also on political violence in Ukraine, and we have all seen the events of January the 6th in Washington, D.C. on our TV screens. In your opinion, is political violence a threat, uh, a credible threat to contemporary democracy in the East and in the West? So as you know, I work in the United States in Arizona. So um, I'm always very worried about students who are unhappy with me because I know they can shoot me at any minute. So certainly if you think about the West broadly and if you say, think about what happened uh, in the United States on January 6th, um, you have to um, contemplate the possibility that radical right mobilization, of course, spills over un in into uncivil society or extremist, um, uh, you know, societal mobilization that can um, that can have sort of, you know, very serious political implications. Um, of course, there are big, um, you know, variations in gun ownership and access to violence in Western Europe um, and the United States and in Ukraine. But I think, in general, I would say that. Um, the threat of violence, the threat of you know physical security to minorities, and sort of the, the general uh, sense of physical safety, is something that needs to be studied more. And you know, and when I talk about extremist mobilization, of course, you know there is a very well and robust field that deals with terrorist attacks. But I think we have to you know start taking seriously what happens to voters or to citizens when they don't feel as members of the LGBT community. We sort of see in Poland already, there is a, you know, there is an exodus and this will have um, voting implications. I mean, I also think that uh, anti-Semitism is something that has, we have to be reckoned with. For example, in the United States, uh, of course, nobody underestimates the violence against um, members of the African uh, community, but the fact that a lot of the data suggests that there is a really, you know, serious spike in anti-Semitic attacks, you know, nobody in a way pays attention to it and takes it seriously. And I think similarly, the threats of violence, the threats that scholars get, you know, by, you know, Sarah Delange can certainly speak to this more than I do. The fact that there is, uh, you know, bullying, cyberbullying, threats of violence, and uh, this is, you know, and sort of th this is sort of a new toolkit, I think, of radical art mobilization that that has to be taken very seriously. Thank you, uh, thank you, Lenka, for 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 this important uh, for this important uh, answer and highlighting these important issues, including uh, academic freedoms and uh, relationship uh, or the peril facing scholars of uh, of uh, radical right. Uh, in their real life, both online and offline. I would like to move to Andre. And for Andre, I have, uh, I have these two following questions. So in your work, you focus on political mobilization and social movements. So Mark Murray Howard famously saw significant weakness of the post-communist civil society. Looking at the vibrancy of protests from women's protests in Poland to million moments for democracy in the Czech Republic, does your research detect a significant weakness comparing social movements in the East and the West? And are there significant differences and can they be traced to the previous regime perhaps? And the second question in your book with Manuela Kayani, Radical Right Movement Parties in Europe, you focused on the radical right movement parties 
Can you elaborate on transnational cooperation among these movement parties? Are they successful in bridging the East-West divide? So are there not just these nice bridges, but also uh, radical right bridges? Andre, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello. Uh, thank you for inviting me for this uh, super interesting discussion. And uh, before coming to these two specific questions, I will also reply to the general one, namely how to, how to deal with these uh, specificities versus general trends uh, kind of thing in my research. I actually focus mostly on, on uh, Central East European context, uh, but always try to interpret uh, my results in the discussion with the results coming also from different contexts, which is the only way I think which uh, comparative politics should be done. And uh, the examples I, uh, I, I have is uh, on activism, forms, forms of activism, and then uh, some other ones. Uh, so, you know, in Eastern Europe, a new type of activism, kind of new type of activism was detected, uh, sometimes called transactional activism, uh, activism which is non-participatory based on uh, organizational cooperation. And uh, if you, you know, look at it uh, in a broader context, if you interpret this uh, in a, a context of available research also from other contexts, uh, you can see that uh, it might not be that, you know, specific and uh, unique uh, to this post-communist context, but it uh, very much resembles, you know, types of activism which uh, developed also in the West, uh, largely in the last quarter of the 20th century, sometimes labeled, you know, activism without members. And uh, it also then calls, you know, for further research, uh, which I have done on, on the diffusion mechanisms and how, you know, different con policy content and how different models, you know, travel across regions. And uh, this is uh, also, you know, possible way how to approach you know this uh, uh, this uh, kind of east west divide because it might not exist you know even in reality it is it has been already you know crossed you know on different levels and uh, uh, in different uh, in, in different social spheres and what i have done in my research was uh, basically studying the ways how how uh, political activism and civil society organization organizations uh, cross this uh, this this divide Looking at the same uh, problem from a different angle, uh, so from a different uh, different angle, I can say that based on my research, uh, there is as much uh, variation in the region or within the region as there is between, you know, these two macro regions. For example, uh, we I don't think that we have any you know particular type of uh, East European form of protest or or populism for that matter, uh, which is a very much discussed topic. Uh, lately, uh, I did some comparative work on Central East European countries and uh, regarding uh, protest agenda or national protest agenda, which is concept concept basically describing you know the profile of protests uh, in a given country. And uh, what we have actually learned is that you know uh, in these different countries we can see you know differently organized protests and. Uh, uh, we also try to account for that and used, you know, an argument based on different configurations of party politics. So linking up not only, you know, here link, trying to link up not only East-West uh, uh, divide, but also, you know, this divide between people working on political parties and social movement and protest. And uh, similar thing can be said, I think, about uh, populism and how it developed in different countries. Uh, how it presents itself and what are its you know implications, uh, which are far from uniform according, uh, across you know uh, different countries. Uh, uh, what uh, you know the examples which I could use here would be the Czech Republic, the country I'm sitting uh, in right now, where we you know identify usually this technocratic type of populism with its signature slogan, "Let's run the state as a firm." Right? Then you know if you look at the, for example the Hungarian case, which is uh, which is very close, and uh, Hungary understood as, this, as part of the same uh, context of Central Eastern Europe. Uh, this uh, form, the type of populism which developed in Hungary, uh, differs very much. It's uh, not, you know, based on, a, on, on, argu on economic arguments, or it's not. Uh, it doesn't present itself uh, with the help of uh, managerial, you know, logic and, and rhetoric, but. Uh, 
it's uh, openly nationalist and it's it's deeper kind of you know based uh, and, and discussing national identity not effectiveness of the state and uh, it's a uh, main presentation and also you know policy implications i think uh, different different uh, differ greatly all in all i would say that uh, there is uh, no one type that fits all uh, in even in eastern europe uh, in that sense you know uh, and i'm in agreement with uh, other people speaking here, you know, on the panel, uh, this East-West divide can actually hide uh, as much as it reveals. And, uh, you know, to make some kind of, you know, illustration uh, with also research by other people, you know, Sean Henley has lately, you know, discussed this uh, problem of democratic backsliding in Eastern Europe uh, and also calling for this more, you know, Nian approach to basically calling for the end of uh, this backsliding paradigm and uh, claiming that uh, in different contexts, we can see different manifestations of this process. And uh, if we understand that, we can also react to these different manifestations uh, in, a, in a more adequate way uh, compared to if we just, you know, see just one, one uh, process in all of these different contexts. And now uh, coming to uh, the specific questions uh, asked uh, uh, in the beginning, uh, might speak uh, participation, uh, political participation and differences uh, uh, between Eastern and Western Europe. I think that uh, here, as again, based on research, uh, uh, we need to distinguish uh, political participation uh, as uh, something taking place on the individual level and uh, basically describing the ways uh, people engage in politics from from political activism uh, what is uh, or organized civil society which is the focus of my research more than individual level political participation uh, and uh, while this mostly survey research uh, uh, from individual level uh, really you know shows uh, these differences uh, showing on average although there are exceptions but on average showing lower level, levels of participation in East European countries. The same cannot be said probably about this organized civil society. And uh, uh, there is a lot of research basically showing that uh, after, after, after the fall of communism in post-communist countries, uh, groups of capable advocates and political activists uh, developed and they were able to organize effective political campaigns. Again, you know, to summarize it uh, and to conclude, uh, I wouldn't say that uh, we can, you know, uh, end up with saying uh, civil society in Eastern Europe is weak. Uh, it needs to be specified. It needs to uh, it needs to be uh, also contextualized. And uh, you know, said like this, this is a kind of sweeping generalization. And the last one, and I'll be very short here, uh, is on this transnational influences, uh, which is related to my research on diffusion and uh, well yes of course uh, also uh, radical right uh, organizations and political parties cooperate uh, uh, that we know uh, particle ways are sometimes you know hidden so are hidden and uh, difficult to research but uh, i would say that uh, what actually changed lately is the whole context of uh, this transnational cooperation and diffusion. While uh, in the first decade after the fall of communism, what we could observe in Central Eastern Europe was more this, you know, liberal influence, you know, civil society, uh, civil society assistance programs, uh, which were tra which, which were helping these good guys, as you as as, as you put it. Uh, uh, it uh, has changed and. Uh, both uh, organizations and actors coming from the east uh, uh, but also conservative organizations coming from the west uh, started to support a different type of agenda you know so-called traditional values and the whole process uh, started to be more open-ended politicized and uh, not that you know dominated by uh, these western influences okay so that's all for me. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Andre. Uh, the answers are always uh, always more complicated, and I think that makes uh, that makes our work uh, exciting. So I would like to now move to Milada. If you are hearing rain, it is because there is rain. Uh, so I apologize for that. 
But moving to Milada, so the two questions in addition to the general one, and I leave it to Milada to pick uh, and choose. So in your book, Europe Undivided, which I think is a total classic, uh, you have focused on EU leverage over six post-communist accession countries. And so fast forward to today, uh, in what ways did the EU learn from the, from the accession processes as well as the recent democratic decline in some of the member states like Poland and Hungary? Some see the EU's new rule of law mechanism, which will apply to all member states as a beneficial. What is your take? Is it useful? Is it too little too late? And finally, in your recent article, Populism, Democracy and Party System Change in Europe, you compare party system change in Central and Eastern Europe, Western and Southern Europe. You show that while left and central left uh, largely remained unchanged, the mainstream, radical, uh, mainstream right radicalized. Is your concept of ethnopopulism a more useful tool than radical or extreme right to conceptually bridge the East-West divide? Milada, the floor is yours. All right, thank you so much. And thank you so much for organizing this, Petra, and um, for inviting me. This is a wonderful event and I've already learned so much from the other panelists. Um, these are hard questions you've given us, Petra, and I have my crystal ball here, so it can help me <laughs> with the EU question. But, I'll, you know, I'll start with that one, and then I'll move to the comparative po politics questions. Um, you know, I've been reflecting a little bit on, on sort of EU leverage and the context of the quality of democracy. And I think one way to sort of reconceptualize EU leverage over the candidate states in Central and Eastern Europe is that EU leverage actually tempered the power of incumbency. Because what you see today is that in new democracies, and well, they're not so new now, are they? <laughs> Three decades on, but still, um, we see the tremendous power of incumbency, right? That once a party like Fides or Peace gets into power with a majority or an absolute majority, and if they're willing to bust <laughs> through not just institutions, but also norms of behavior, then you know, they can do a tremendous amount of damage to liberal democracy. Um, and this is democratic backsliding. You can find another term for it, but there's no question that they have eroded you know, the liberal democracy, both the institutions and the norms. Um, and so EU leverage in a sense tempered the power of incumbency, right? So if you were in power during um, the accession process, you had to watch what you did. And you can see that a little bit today with Vucic, you know, in Serbia, there's a terrible things on the for civil society and media, but there are still some limits, I think, to what he does. Um, so what about today? Fast forward 20 years for the East Central, southeastern EU members who are post-communist uh, or not. What, what, what can the EU do today to safeguard the quality of democracy? And I think the, <laughs> the academic answer is to go back and just point out, because I think it's so important to point out, that the European Union is only good at those things where EU member states have agreed on the acquis. This is a very simple point, but it is so important. And so EU member states never agreed on an acquis in terms of protecting ethnic minority rights. As a result, in the 1990s, the EU was scrambling to outsource its leverage to the OSCE, the ICTY, the Council of Europe. Something happened, things did get better, but you know, very little leverage today in that area. Same with fighting corruption and same with safeguarding liberal democracy. And you can argue that a crisis can push countries, EU member states, to then move forward in terms of European integration. We see that with the financial crisis, right? You had a big push forward after the financial crisis in terms of banking union. So crisis was followed by greater integration. We don't see that with the migration crisis, and we are not seeing that very effectively with what you could call the the crisis of, of, of regime type in the EU. Um, 
I think it will be helpful, but not in a direct immediate sense, right? Because we have member states that will oppose it, veto it, and of course, Hungary and Poland, but other states as well, right? It's not just Hungary and Poland. And so I think the impact will be the same as in the 90s, uh, part of the impact of EU leverage was supporting domestic groups. And so if these EU mechanisms and reports can help strengthen domestic groups that support rule of law, that want to um, uh, roll back attacks on democratic institutions and help opposition parties that are making these kinds of appeals to the voters, then I think they can have a real impact um, in the medium term. Okay, but nothing quick. Uh, and I think I have to say today, the EU faces a, a huge test, right? With the events in Belarus and the state hijacking of um, a dissident. This is a real moment for the EU to show where it stands when it comes to regime and whether Hungary and Poland and others will be successful in decoupling the European Union from liberal democracy, human rights, protection of journalists and so forth. Uh, so, so let's see how they do. Um, in terms of the second question, and now I only have five minutes left. Um, you know, <clears throat> I'll be brief on the beginning. I think, you know, we obviously have had very specific trajectories of regime change um, after 1989 in Central and Eastern Europe. And what I find so striking is the variation, right? That among all those trajectories of political change before 89 and after, there is tremendous variation and richness uh, in the post-communist region that many West European scholars uh, sadly miss. Um, <laughs> uh, today, you know, we still have that great variation of trajectories both in the East and the West, but we have, I think, you know, as much as the substance of political competition still differs, I would say, you do see a real convergence, um, not just in the instability also that, that Jolt and, and Fernando talked about, but also in the structure of competition. You see parties in the East and the West taking very similar positions, they're converging. And one place that they're converging, which you mentioned in my recent work, is these, what I call ethno-populist parties. And the reason I call them ethno-populist, first of all, it captures a broader category of parties because Fidesz is ethno-populist and peace, but so are the British conservatives under Boris Johnson, this transmogrification of the British Conservative Party. You know, and so is Anno, for example, in the Czech Republic. Um, so it captures a broader category of parties that have very similar to appeals to voters in terms of the us versus them, although you know, flexible in the content of that. But it's a cultural appeal, right? A cultural appeal about us versus them and about keeping out culturally harmful outsiders or removing their power. And it's not just about appealing to voters, it's also about justifying attacks on counter-majoritarian institutions, on minorities. Essentially, it's a way to justify democratic backsliding, if you wanna use that term, or justify majoritarian government, right? Basically saying, you know, if the majority of the people want it, that's democracy. Uh, and very, very clearly attacking counter-majoritarian institutions. And, you know, the British Conservative Party are now trying to restrict access to the vote, right? They've just said that everyone will have to register with obvious consequences for people who are homeless, who don't have the right identification and so forth. So right out of the kind of um, ethno-populist textbook. Now, what's interesting, I think, is that um, to what extent these parties, and, and Jolt and Yeti has also written about this, to what extent these ethno-populist parties have adopted a common script that is external um, in the sense that it's a sort of common distant set of enemies that are cosmopolitan, European elites, the European Union, international institutions, 
but also Islam and Muslim refugees. And we see that in the Chapel Hill Expert Survey across all of these parties, how Islamophobia, with the exception of the British conservatives who don't score highly on this, but Islamophobia is a position that is equally kind of central to, to you know, Fidesz and to Salvini and to the Freedom Party in Austria. And so we have a very, um, uh, unfortunate convergence there. And this has also allowed them to cooperate, right? And so ethnopopulism is about a culturally harmful insiders who are LGBTQ minority or feminists or um, liberals and this kind of transnational conspiracy. Um, the differences, of course, are the constraints of the of the institutions. And so in we still see a difference between East and West. The question is what will happen if Salvini was to get a supermajority in Italy? I mean, it won't happen, but if it did, we would expect him, I think, to, to take many of the same kinds of steps that we've seen in Poland or in Hungary by the peace or Fidesz governments. Let me very quickly, I have one minute to show you a couple slides. Um, if I can find my slides, here we go. This doesn't count. This is just for help me find my slide. Here we go. Okay. Um, this is for the Czechs. I hope you're watching my favorite Czech protester. Um, so here are just a couple of charts from the Chapel Hill expert survey and, and more of these charts can be found in my new article that, that Petra mentioned. Um, so here we see how, you know, on the bottom axis, you have the salience of anti-establishment rhetoric and ethnopopulist parties, parties that are right-wing populist, but I don't like the right, oops, don't do that. I don't like the right-wing because as we see in the Chapel Expert Survey, many of these parties are now adopting left positions when it comes to the traditional economic left and right. Um, so they're, they're, they become very similar here you see Austria and Italy, um, the FPO, the Liga and the Brothers of Italy. They all take very similar positions when it comes to uh, the salience of anti-establishment rhetoric as well as immigration. And this is a chart that's very hard to read, but it, it shows you across all of the cases of ethnopopulist parties that I looked at, the salience of anti-Islam rhetoric. And it's very high for all of them, except for the British Conservative Party. Um, so that article is, is listed up here if you want to see the charts and actually have a chance to absorb them. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Milada. And for our international viewers, uh, the protester said, it's so bad that the Czechs started to pray. Uh, and it uh, refers to the traditional secularism of uh, the Czech Republic, which you wouldn't guess uh, from the number of churches. So sometimes correlation is not causation. Okay, uh, thank you to all of you for keeping on time, for answering questions. The advantage of inviting people is that you can ask them things you always wanted to know about their work. So thank you so much. I have learned uh, so much and I hope so did our audience. And our speaking of our audience, uh, we, have, uh, we have received three questions here. So I, will, uh, I have one directed at Fernando, one at Milada and one uh, which is uh, which doesn't address uh, which addresses the panel so to give melada a moment to breathe i would start with the middle question and uh, whoever wants to answer feel free to answer it so kenneth uh, firstle if i pronounced your name wrongly please uh, uh, don't be mad at me so he asks or or they ask do the authors observe a lot of policy or political learning of far-right parties? Are they using each other as models to become more effective in taking and maintaining political control? Well, just to uh, confirm what Milada said, yes, they do. And this is, I think, a very important difference compared to the 1990s, when you had very diverging authoritarian initiatives in the region. Now they uh, try to come together, they learn from each other. This is something that it's in a way, <laughs> we encourage them to do. I mean, this is what the European Union is about. Uh, what 
complicates the picture to some extent is that, of course, it's not only EU actors who are relevant here, but uh, Russia, uh, for example, is also a very important actor. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Does anybody else want to tackle? Yes, Lenka? Uh, I think this is an excellent question. Um, as a true political scientist, I will always say it's com it's complicated because I think it depends on your definition of far right parties. If you think of them as niche uh, political parties that are mostly out of power, then their policies are actually very simple. You know, it's a um, policy based on um, anti-ethnic, you know, it's an anti-ethnic minority position and a highly socially conservative position. So I don't think there is that much learning because they're already at the extreme. However, if you think about some parties um, the way I think, but of course not everybody does, as radicalized mainstream parties, then um, we are, you know, maybe not so much talking about policy, but we are talking about the technology of power. And then, as Joel said, there is a um, fantastic learning process and diffusion. There is a reason why there is something that's called the Orban textbook. But I would like to highlight um, one aspect that, um, you know, I think it sort of touches on some of the other questions is that, um, you know, weaponization of social policy programs to um, maintain power and to reward voters for their loyalty. That seems, you know, I have sort of in my article with Herbert Kitchell in 2009, we already noted that far right parties are on the left, but I think uh, once you move to the domain of parties of power, this is becoming a very powerful package that's being offered and a very appealing package to voters who are in general quite poor. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And Milada? Yeah, just very quickly. Um, you know, we often think of Brexit as having warned countries, right? Warned them away from trying to leave the EU. But actually, I think, you know, Brexit also has a uh, this learning that has happened has been as a result of seeing how the British conservatives, a small faction of them, could remodel the entire British Conservative Party using this kind of ethno populist us versus them cast on the European stage and against migrants. Um, and what Linka says is absolutely right. The two greatest sort of consequences of the rise of populism, particularly culturally right populism in Europe over the last decade are Brexit on the one hand and authoritarian rule in Hungary on the other. And both of these are the product of mainstream conservative parties that have been remodeled using this ethnopopulism. And I think that other parties are, are watching. And, and so the question is, are factions within parties, right? So one party I worry about is in Austria, the, the OVP which has already has very um, similar views to the Freedom Party on a number of issues uh, and, and other, other parties as well. Thank you so uh, thank you so much uh, to all of you and I think our uh, uh, our uh, question was uh, uh, answered. So I would like to move to a question by Michele Zadra. Again, sorry if I butchered your, uh, butchered your name and it's for Fernando and I assume Jolt. Can you justify why you were grouping Western and Southern European countries while I may see why Eastern European countries are put in the same basket for comparative purposes? I struggle to understand the rationale for the other two groups. Isn't it possible to find strong similarities across the groups and a strong differences within the same group? Isn't the West-South split then a quite artificial and not really effective classification? What am I missing? Thank you. Yeah, uh, Michaela, that's how I feel uh, most of the time about the Eastern Europe. But uh, Fernando and Joel, the floor is yours. Yes, to be honest, you know, this is what I also wanted to 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 show. And you know, I think it was it was it was Lenka also who, who was mentioning, you know, that Eastern Europe is not just one basket, right? That you know we have you know different uh, regions and you know they they vary a lot within Eastern Europe. And still, you know, just trying to address you know specifically uh, the questions and before I, I go to to give 
you know, the answer I would like to say that, you know, in the book, you know, we have, you know, many other uh, classifications you know, according to the degree of closure, according to type of party system, according to trajectories in party system structuration. So it's not, you know, this kind of, you know, uh, regional, uh, according to waves of democracy. And, and in fact, you know, this allows me to, to answer the question, I mean, you know, I mean, I think that despite the similarities between the West and South, you know, the, the, the most of the countries, you know, democratize at, you know, different, different times. You know? So in the book, we distinguish between five different ways of, of democracy. So in this sense, you know, we, we diverge a bit from, you know, Huntington's traditional, you know, uh, distinction. Uh, also because, you know, I mean, uh, if we put West, South and East, we have more or less, you know, equal number of countries in each of the groupings. If we were to put the West all together, you know, we will have, you know, very, you know, unbalanced, you know, number of countries in the West in comparison with, with, with the East. Also, because, you know, I mean, uh, in, the, in the South, there were more and, and more, you know, and longer breaks of democracy, meaning that, you know, the, the, the authoritarian you know, periods, you know, were, were, were longer in the South than, than, than in the West. Uh, but still, even if you know we were to follow you know the, the 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 grouping together of west and east and as you could see in, in most of the time periods in the three graphs that i showed the south tend to you know behave you know very similar you know to the to the west the only thing is that you know we didn't want to you know let's say uh, contaminate this pure or more pure, you know, a, a comparison between West and East, but, you know, compensating, you know, with the South uh, party systems into the uh, Western European uh, cluster. But, you know, Schultz may, may want to, 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 to add to this. Just a footnote that, of course, all these uh, groupings are problematic. But interestingly, uh, something happened recently that made the let's call it South-West divide more uh, relevant. And that was the 2008 financial crisis. So these countries were affected. The South was affected differently than the rest of Western Europe. East was also affected differently. And the responses were also different. Hans-Peter Kriese and his colleagues had a book about that. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Fernando and, uh, and Jolt for the, for the answer. And uh, the last question here from, from our forum, and then I have two from Twitter. So this question is from viewer 497255 for Milada. To what extent the European party families such as EEP, PES, follow the logic of EU's approach of tempering the incumbencies in your opinion and why? Hopefully it's somebody from the European Parliament. <laughs> That's right. So I think this tempering incumbency um, is really a part of the accession process. So this really only applies if a country is still a candidate for EU membership. Um, and here, you know, the European People's Party sheltered, enabled, facilitated, um, befriended Orban for, for a decade while he was dismantling liberal democracy in Hungary. So the European People's Party has a huge, I mean, this is hugely to blame for, for the fact that the EU didn't act when Hungary was, democracy was being taken apart there. And why they did that, I mean, I still am I'm waiting for somebody to write a really good article about, you know, to what extent was this political greed, just the short time horizon, just wanting to have that power in the European Parliament? To what extent was it affinity with these traditional values that Orban espouses, which have become more and more, you know, homophobic and sexist? I don't know. I mean, I think the European People's Party, especially the, the German CDU, has a, a lot of a lot of blame there. More broadly, I think that these parties could have a positive effect. You know, Fico was suspended by the International Socialist Party, I think, for a while while he was in coalition with the far right and the far left. Um, but generally, though, I don't think that this is really where you're going to see the kind of um, some kind of check on on democratic backsliding. I think the problem for the EU is that as an institution, 
the European Union needs to decide that liberal democracy is a fundamental anchor of European integration. Uh, and that'll be a sea change, right? I mean, remember Berlusconi, nobody did anything about Berlusconi. He was clearly dismantling uh, liberal democracy in different ways, busting through norms of things like independent media, but he wasn't exporting it, you know, and, and everyone just left Berlusconi alone. Uh, so, so the EU will really need to see this as a crisis. Uh, and I, I'm afraid that with so many other things on its plate, this is one of the problems, right? That with the financial crisis and the migration crisis, um, and also such variation in terms of interest uh, when it comes to dealing with these regimes and dealing with Russia. It is a lot um, to expect from the EU at this time. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Milada. I will now move. We have two more questions we have received uh, from Twitter. So one is by Piotr Marczynski. And I think maybe perhaps it was already answered, but I think he, I was happy he asked. So I'm, uh, I'm going to read the question. With the introduction of the Polish deal by the governing uh, PiS, the party went further in the direction of its conservative vision of the welfare state. Do you think it can be analytically fruitful to perceive it within the context of pan-European shift of the radical right parties towards pro-welfare nativist positions. After all, the journey of law and justice from neoliberal to conservative statism, the intention of alternative for Germany or Front National, or would it be better to perceive the phenomena as a regional specific? Whoever wants to take. Um, I think it's an excellent question. I'm sure a lot of people on the panel have thought about this as well. Um, I would like to remind everybody that sort of originally the Western European far-right parties were fiscally conservative with a combination of welfare chauvinism, which is not the same thing as a radicalized mainstream party with access to state resources and patronage, you know, reshaping and targeting um, voters with welfare policy. So I think, you know, that as I sort of mentioned, this is, um, fantastic new package. We see uh, similar social policies boosting fertility, you know, aimed at boosting fertility in other countries as well, including the Balkans. Uh, this is a new deal. It's a response to a huge demographic and labor shortage crisis. Uh, but I think, again, the devil is in the detail here is that you are look at, looking more of, um, you know, a sort of a, fam uh, you know, familial policy combined with strong identity politics. So I will leave it at that. Thank you, Lenka. Jolt. I think it is a great issue to show com how convergence and specificity can coexist, uh, partly uh, because of what Lenka said. So in one case, you speak more about ideology. In the other case, you speak more about policies, because of, in one case, you have parties in government. In the other case, typically, they are in opposition. But the other difference is that um, uh, the public opinion has always been more pro redistribution in the East than in the West. And perhaps even more importantly, the intellectual traditions in the East have typically been more pro statist or statist than in the West. So what you see is indeed similarity and convergence, but from a, a different starting point and, and from some of different motivations and different implications. And we have to know both the fact that they are getting similar and also the separate reasons why they do so. Thank you so much, Milada. Yes, quickly, um, I agree completely. And, you know, on the policy level, we also need to look at, I mean, these peace and, and FIDES have been in power long enough that there's some track record, right? And so Dorothea Sikra has some great papers um, where she actually compares Poland and Hungary and shows that FIDES has not in fact really uh, tackled poverty or child poverty because it's, it's uh, kind of nativist left welfare state is really just a way to buy off certain kinds of already wealthier voters. Whereas in Poland, it has had a reduction, uh, there has been an across the board reduction in, in child poverty. 
Um, but in terms of party positions, Jan Rovni and others have written a lot about this. We see in the Chapel Hill Expert Survey that Fidesz and Peace are resolutely on the left when it comes to um, their positions on the left-right economic divide. And that's been true for Fidesz forever. But uh, uh, in Western Europe, it's much more complicated, right? Our experts not sure, there's a lot of blurring, the standard deviations are high, but there is a general trend of these far-right and ethno-populist parties moving towards the left. And in terms of policy, just look at Boris Johnson, right? He's now trying to put some economic substance into his cultural, kind of appeals to working class voters in Britain. Let's see if he succeeds. Thank you, Milada. And uh, I mean, if we could, I think our audience would like to stay much longer, but uh, I will try to take uh, one final question and then uh, then give you the opportunity to, to say a last uh, word. So we, we would be remiss. We have one question by Tim Houghton. So speaking of the devil or speaking of Tim, uh, thanks for fascinating panel. If we were to take Europe as a whole, do you see there is a convergence or divergence between Europe and other parts of the world? Is Europe out of kilter and exceptional? How far do the theories we generate from Western or Eastern Europe travel? So as uh, you know, I'm sure Melada has a lot of say to that, but it would be nice if scholars of American politics read some literature on Western European far right and Eastern European far right. And I think the, the developments in the Republican Party in the United States point to very, very disturbing trends. And there is you know, a lot to be learned from our literatures. Thank you, Lenka. Fernando? Well, uh, I, I, I'm I'm extending the, the the project that I started, you know, uh, in in Europe to 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 other regions of the world, and especially, you know, I have been working with a colleague here at the, at the University of Nottingham, uh, Dr. Don Lee, and you know, we we find that, you know, I mean, some of the of the processes that we we see in 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 the in, in Europe in general, you know, for some, you know, this relationship, you know, between party system stability and, you know, consolidation of democracy, you know, tend to certainly, you know, uh, be uh, beneficial, you know, but there are, of course, you know, other, other idiosyncrasies, like, for example, the colonial legacies that, you know, you don't have, for example, you know, in the case of Europe that, you know, complicate a, a bit the picture, you know, and moreover, you know, I mean, when we think, I mean, when, when we write in the book, you know, a lot of the literature that we, we look at uh, when dealing with party system institutions comes from Latin America. So, you know, we, we think, you know, we haven't tested it, you know, but we think, you know, some of the, you know, conclusions that we, we have in, in the book we could certainly be, be, be applied, you know, um, to, to the Latin American uh, context. But of course, you know, I mean, they are important, you know, more even the similarities that we can see between, you know, uh, East and West. Thank you, Fernando Milada. Um, I'll just say in one area, right, we have now, we do now have a, a comparative politics literature that kind of spans the globe and that's populism, right? So many conferences about global populism and we certainly do see, and I've had students writing about Bolsonaro, about the American Republican Party, about Modi in India, and we certainly do see a very common playbook. Uh, and that common playbook has these two steps that I talked about, right? One is how do you appeal to voters, especially initially when you initially want to win? And second, how do you uh, concentrate power once, you're, once, once you've won the elections? Um, but that global populism literature is also, I think, a problem in some ways because it doesn't, it generalizes too much across all kinds of populism. And so when we look at the European context, we see populist parties on the cultural right that have a very specific set of appeals that have taken these steps towards democratic backsliding. We don't see that on the left. Now that doesn't mean it won't happen, but so far those left-wing populist parties that have been in power, I don't see a lot of evidence for um, backsliding. And so I think one of the problems is just in part terminology and, and getting your, paper accepted at journals, uh, you know, the impact of populism 
is a big subject and a big, you know, everyone wants to show that their article shows, I have like three on my desk, you know, the effect of populism on party systems, the effect of populism on democratic quality. But when you actually look inside these populist parties, I think they're very different. Uh, and I think it's really important to distinguish, um, you know, between different kinds of populist parties. So maybe limiting a little bit this kind of global reach. Thank you so much, Milada. Uh, unfortunately, we won't be uh, addressing uh, the other questions uh, uh, and uh, to go. So I would like to give to all of you a space to say a final words. And perhaps it would be if you could integrate. Christian uh, Surubaru has uh, asked us what type of out of the box solution do you envision in bridging division, artificial as they may be, between East and the West. So I thought that would be a good way to, to kind of uh, end, uh, end uh, our panel. So who wants to, perhaps each of you want to say either final words or incorporate uh, some kind of ways to bridge the East-West. Okay, and I think that, you know, we ended up here with discussing the question how to deal with populism it's in its you know different variants probably and uh, i think that Milada is right that we need to you know take into account uh, these differences and uh, different ways how it presents uh, itself in different contexts at the same time it seems to me that also you know with this described uh, described move to the way how this populist discourse is articulated today in, you know, including this economic left basically uh, into its uh, uh, political discourse. Uh, what we need is less, uh, you no know, discussion, and maybe even European Union cannot do much about that. Maybe you know the support for local groups also mentioned here, but I don't think it can be you know solved uh, from top down. And uh, what we need uh, in general is a kind of resurgence of social democracy in a different form, probably or or different forms even. Uh, I'm not saying that we you know, should go somehow back and it, it's not possible even, but uh, at, at least you know, in many uh, East European countries, this space uh, which opened up for you know, populist parties to, to, to acquire was created by a kind of political suicide of social democratic parties or, or parties which were in that position. And I uh, think that uh, politically speaking and speaking about uh, how to deal with this challenge. Uh, this is the only, the only very general suggestion I can have right now. Okay, so, you know, I mean, given that, you know, it's out of the box and, you know, we can imagine, right? I think that, you know, I mean, I, I, I had the opportunity to write, you know, an article with Jose Rama that was published at the Journal of Democracy you know, in January, and I think that there what we what we recommend, you know, to tackle, you know, the crisis of democracy that we are seeing both in East and West, you know, it was the, the, the need for, you know, party regeneration. Perhaps, you know, we were a bit too idealistic there, right? But I think, you know, it is important that, you know, there is a, 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 a new way of, you know, uh, transformation of political parties in the sense that, you know, I mean, uh, as, uh, you know, Andre was, was thinking, you know, it's not about, you know, solving, you know, the, the, the problems, you know, from, from, from the top, you know, the, the need, you know, that, you know, uh, parties need to really institutionalize. We do this argument, you know, in the, in the book, but, you know, in the sense that I think that both in the East, uh, but also in the West, you know, there is this uh, let's say uh, political leaders have for forgotten about the importance, for example, of uh, political party organization and the, the need for really, you know, make uh, organizations uh, strong. Perhaps, you know, the fact that, you know, more and more we have, as we mentioned, you know, in, in today's talk, you know, more new parties that, you know, are successful immediately after they are being formed, you know, they tend to forget that, you know, it is important for the long term, not the short term, you know, to have this type of, you know, very uh, strong uh, organizations. And, you know, many, many other aspects that we look at, at, at in that, um, you know, article. Thank you. Thank you, Fernando. Uh, who wants to continue, Jolt? Uh, yes, I would come back to an issue that has been raised several times, and this is the issue of generalization. So I think it's important to differentiate two things. On the one hand, in what directions 
a system change. And here one can make the claim that there is a general shift towards uh, de-democratization. That happens globally, happens almost in all corners of the world. On the other hand, whatever terrible news we hear from um, France, Denmark, Czechia, and so on, these are different sorts of problems than what you confront in Hungary, Serbia, Russia, and the host of other countries. So we have to uh, keep, uh, uh, stay aware that, that there are certain qualitative jumps in, in, in this process of autocratization. And once you went over a certain threshold, mechanisms also change, and probably scholarship should also change. We should study different issues. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jolt. Milada, would you like to? Um, sure. So I, a couple of the questions in the chat were sort of asking about sort of, you know, how can we explain the erosion of liberal democracy, uh, particularly in Eastern Europe? And one mentioned the failure of the center and the left parties. And that I think is an argument that's made across the board in Europe, right? That center, main center and left wing parties in a way lost their connection to the voters. Um, and so that's a big literature. And, and I think there's definitely, that's part of the story. The other question was about capitalist development in the West and whether that has um, impacted the East. And again, that's a big literature that of course has a lot of great points. Um, I think what is so puzzling, I think, is that the countries that have experienced the greatest backsliding, Poland and Hungary, you know, they are among the very wealthiest. Um, also the Czech Republic, very among the very wealthiest of the post-communist EU members, right? And so it's not a question of having been so disadvantaged by joining the European Union and having their economies integrated into this, um, into the EU, but there might be a kind of resentment in terms of rising expectations. Joanna Fomina writes about this in her article about Poland um, with Jacek Kucharczyk, you know, about how kind of people's resentment, you know, it's not so much their action, how they actually are doing, but sort of their senses of resentment. But here I would really point to two things. One is the changing media environment, which I think has been incredibly consequential. In the Czech Republic, for example, we see a huge transformation in political attitudes, especially towards Muslims. And so much of that has been driven by social media, by the control of a lot of the media, by a small number of, uh, let's call them political entrepreneurs. Um, and, and so the juxtaposition of political entrepreneurs this changing media environment and the ability to capitalize on resentment is I think incredibly important. And so then the question becomes, how does that vary across different party systems along different elect, uh, among different electorates? Does it vary based on existing attitudes among the population? Does it vary in terms of how well the um, independent media is safeguarded and, and harmful social media is controlled? Does it vary based on the influence of Russia and the ability of uh, a lot of money coming in from Russia and so forth? So I think there are so many unanswered questions, but this is where the really interesting work is in trying to explain the variation. And you know, nobody expected 20 years ago that Hungary would be the one to go, right? And so we have such a, such a rich, I think, set of of political developments in the East. And so there's so much great work being done on that. And if, but at the same time, I really believe, and this is why I like your question so much, Petra, for this panel, that East Central Europe is, is in a way showing what happens when you have these um, both attitudes, resentments, political entrepreneurs in the, in the political context today post-financial crisis, post-refugee crisis. Tim Houghton has made this point as well, right? This is perhaps unfortunately a time when our East Central European countries are, are theory generating uh, in terms of political change. Thank you so much, Milada Lenka. Um, yes, thank you. Last but not least, uh, so this is a, you know, in a follow-up on um, Milada's thoughts on capitalist development. I think one way to bridge the divide is to have an open con conversation uh, whether 
you know, economic development and economic trends in East, West and the South are a zero sum or a positive sum game. Sometimes it's a positive sum game for sure. Sometimes it's a zero sum game as, you know, many books on Greece were written. And so we should really think about um, political implications of economic policies driven by Western European interests uh, for uh, democratic transitions and democratic resiliency. So, you know, Germany and CDU and EP, I'm looking at you, how much are the assembly factories in Hungary worth, you know, to you? There are obviously very adversarial effects of massive brain drain from the East and the fact that the West is, you know, plugging nurses, you know, care workers and doctors from the East, you know, this is a social policy that's greatly beneficial, but, um, you know, leaves, um, uh, you know, leave sort of a scorched earth. When I lived in Prague for one year, my daughter is a Czech citizen. I had difficulty finding a pediatrician for her and that's just like, an, it's a minor thing. So I think having an honest discussion about economic policies, um, you know, being sometimes incredibly beneficial and I think an overly economic liberalization was a phenomenal, in some way, a phenomenal success in the East but there is no free lunch. And I think, especially in terms of welfare provision and social policies and some of the consequences of migration of care workers are a, a, you know, a big avenue of research that needs to be addressed you know, uh, clearly and with, you know, without blaming anyone, but just like understanding that these things have implications and they generate resentment. I mean, going back to some of the topics. Thank you. It was a great panel, by the way. <laughs> Thank you, Lenka. I would like to thank, uh, we have come to the uh, to the end. Unfortunately, I could definitely spend here much more time, but uh, it is the time has come. So I would like to thank to our panelists, to Fernando, Casal Bertois, Jolt Enedi, Lenka Buštíková, Mila Davachudová, and Andrzej Císař for their insightful input, for, uh, for great answers and uh, and overall such a breadth of uh, amazing breadth of knowledge. I would like to th thank Michelle Perotino, Hanna Kubatova, the Department of Political Science at the Faculty of Social Sciences, Charles University, the ECPR Central Services, Brady Gaynor, and to our viewers for their interest, time and questions. And I would like to end with a quote uh, by Václav Havel on hope. The kind of hope that I often think about, I understand above all as a state of mind, not as a state of the world. Either we have hope with us or we don't. It's a dimension of the soul. It's not essentially dependent upon some particular observation of the world or estimate of the situation. Hope is not the uh, conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense regardless of how it turns out. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for viewing and have a nice evening. Goodbye. <laughs>